And Professor Danielle Olden will be presenting the uh, paper on the history of the Western region. She is Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah and is the author of a book called Racial Uncertainties, Mexican Americans, School Desegregation and the Making of Race in Post-Civil Rights America. And that's gonna be published next month. So we need to add this to our book talk series, Elizabeth. Um, and it's gonna be coming out from the University of California Press. She is widely published and um, she is, I, I think she's done a terrific job. I don't wanna just go overboard with all the accomplishments. So I'm gonna, we're gonna post the uh, biographical sketches in the chat function, but I just wanted to give you some highlights. Uh, now our next uh, white paper is on the demography of the Western region. And this is co-authored by Professor Amelie Constant and a Professor Doug Massey. We're very lucky because Professor Constant and Professor Massey have actually authored our white papers on demography for the Northeast and the South, as well as the West. So they have a unique comparative perspective. And I believe they're going to be doing the one on the Midwest. So we'll have a comprehensive picture of the de demographic changes in the region. Professor Massey had an unexpected conflict, so he'll be sending a recording of the presentation, but Professor Constant will be here to answer questions, and she is completely fluent with all the data because she crunches it to put together these really impressive, comprehensive reports. Um, Pro uh, Professor Constant is a visiting research scholar at the Office of Pop Population Research at Princeton University, and her research lies mainly in the economics of immigration, and she is co-editor of an international handbook of the economics of migration. So another a great a source, uh, Professor Massey is the Henry G. Bryant, Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University. And he is co-author of American Apartheid, which won the Distinguished Publication Award of the American Sociological Association and of Climbing Mount Laurel, which won the Paul Davidoff Award, and he publishes extensively on issues of immigration. Finally, and certainly last but not least, we will hear from Thomas Sines, who is President and General Counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, he has worked tirelessly in promoting civil rights. I don't think I could think of a more influential figure in the legal community in this regard. He uh, previously was in the civil rights uh, litigation division at Maldiv. He worked there for 12 years, including four years as vice president of litigation. He also was counsel to Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villarregosa and has received numerous honors, including the Oatley Award in 2006 and the 2010 Corazon Award from Univision and the ABA Spirit of Excellence award in 2013. I know how hard it is to get that Spirit of Excellence award because I've been at some of those ceremonies at ABA meetings. So what we have is, is just a stellar group of white paper authors. And I wanted to turn the session over to them. And this session will be recorded because we wanted to let the public also be aware of some of the findings, which we think are really interesting from this work. And these papers ultimately will be posted on the Future of Latinos website. Okay, so we're going to start with Professor Olden and the history of the region. Okay, thank you, Rachel, so much for that introduction. Um, and folks, I, I want to say, first of all, that I woke up this morning and immediately had technical problems. <laughs> so um, Elizabeth is actually going to be running my PowerPoint. Um, so you'll hear me say slide. Um, not ideal, but hopefully it works for us. So um, I wanted to start my remarks today with a story about my family. Uh, slide. Mi familia, two words that are so central to the Latinx experience. There is even a Hollywood film uh, by that very title. And if you've seen it, you know that it tells the story of a family. And that story begins where so many of our stories began and that is with a migration north to the United States. My own family's history in the West spans centuries. On one side, my ancestors long resided in Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado, 
where they called themselves Hispanos and lived in small rural communities that often were somewhat isolated. On the other side, my great grandparents migrated from Mexico to Laramie, Wyoming in the 1920s, where they had three children and stayed for the rest of their lives. For both sides of my family, it was work for the Union Pacific Railroad Company that brought them to Wyoming. Now this family history illustrates how economic migration led to generations of people who call the Mountain West home. And in these images here, this is the two sides of my, uh, two sides of my family. So in the upper right, um, the Leyva family in Colorado in 1912, uh, and on the bottom, the, uh, some members of the Gonzalez family in the 1930s in, in Laramie, Wyoming. In the 1930s, as the Great Depression ravaged the nation, my great-grandfather, Secundino Martinez, left his family in Las Truchas, New Mexico to migrate north in search of work. Slide. Working first as a sheep herder in Colorado, he followed his fortunes even farther north to work for the Union Pacific Railroad in Southeast Wyoming. A couple of years later, his wife and children joined him in Bosler, Wyoming, a tiny railroad town that boasted a total population of only a couple hundred people. Soon they followed the railroad line to Rock River, Wyoming, a similarly small town with a population of 349 people. Now there were other Latinx families in this small community as railroad work was highly sought after by Latinxes throughout the US West, yet they remained a numerical minority. In the late 1940s, the Martinez family moved once again, this time to Laramie, Wyoming, where they settled permanently. Secundino, who you can see on the left side um, of the screen there, that's Secundino and Laura uh, Martinez, my great grandparents. Uh, Secundino worked for the Union Pacific until his retirement, as did several of his sons and sons-in-law. Laramie, a railroad town that became a college town, had a significant Mexican-American population by mid 20th century. Segregated mostly on the city's west side, the proverbial other side of the tracks, these Mexican-Americans organized for social and economic betterment by establishing community organizations, they created vibrant, a vibrant community culture, and they resisted white racism. Slide. Here are just a couple of great images of my grandparents, my grandfather in the upper left with friends from 1951, my grandmother with friends in the early 1950s on the bottom there, just really demonstrating the sort of various ways that Latinx has created community in small towns like Laramie, Wyoming. Slide. And here you can see my grandmother, uh, she's pictured kind of in the middle on the far right, uh, and a group of friends, they formed the Hispano Americano Women's Club in Laramie in the late 1950s, um, a sort of a social civic organization, um, a Latina um, component of what was known as the Women's Club in the United States. Uh, and I did some, some early work of mine is on this wonderful club of women and they did so much in the community of Laramie to protect children, to provide a better environment, to go into their children's schools and just do the type of work that, some of the work that we'll be talking about today. Slide. Today, the population of Laramie is 31,407 and Latinxes make up approximately 10.8% of the population. And this was just very serendipitous. This wonderful uh, mural just went up in Laramie a couple of days ago. It's a new piece by Judy Herrera, um, really sort of laying claim to Laramie uh, for Latinxes in the city and saying, we have been here for a long time as my history, uh, family's history illustrates. Now the history of Latinxes in the West, or I'm sorry, this history that I've, I've started with with my family, this type of history is less well known than that of Latinxes in cities like Los Angeles or El Paso. But there are countless small and medium-sized cities, as well as farming areas throughout the region, where Latinxes created families, lives, and communities. While most of the historical scholarship on Latinxes has focused on those places with the largest Latinx populations, emerging scholarship is beginning to document these lesser known stories. And this work will undoubtedly 
contribute to a more holistic and inclusive history of Latinxes in the US West. Now, my white paper focused on economic participation and education, although I did touch upon some of the ways that immigration and civic participation and political mobilization were intertwined. My hope in that paper was to provide a history that was broad enough to trace important trends and themes in Latinx history, but also specific enough to guide our conversations about the future of Latinxes in this region. So today I want to expand a bit more on some of these themes to focus attention on what I think are some of the most pressing issues for Latinxes in the contemporary US. Like the protagonist in Mi Familia and like my own family, economic migration is really at the heart of why so many Latinxes have called the West home. Uprooting, movement to a new locale, and the building of new lives most often starts with an economic need, a desire for that elusive thing, economic security. Certainly, there are other reasons why people migrated, but economics is central. People go where there are job opportunities. Over the course of the late 19th and 20th centuries, as local economies in the US West developed and grew, more and more workers were needed to sustain such monumental growth. Slide. El Paso, Texas, a city on the US-Mexico border illustrates the kind of economic transformation I'm talking about. Between the 1880s and World War I, the city morphed from really a small, tiny community to a buzzing industrial hub at the center of a growing transnational transportation and mining circuit between the United States and Mexico. As the railroad expanded and mining interests pulled more and more mineral wealth from the earth, increasing numbers of people made their way to the city, including many ethnic Mexicans. The population grew 14 fold between 1880 and 1890, increasing in just a single decade from 736 to 10,300 people. And it grew exponentially from there. In 1920, the population was 77,560. And in 1950, it was 130,485. Historians estimate that somewhere around 1.5 million Mexicans migrated to the United States between 1900 and 1930. Many of them landed in El Paso and similar industrial corridors, places like Denver, Colorado and San Jose, California. Now, while job opportunities brought them to these places, brought more Latinxes into the West, these migrations did not often lead to the economic security these migrants sought. One of the reasons so many Mexicans and other Latinxes have been sought after as a labor source is that employers operating in deeply racialized social and economic environments could pay them far less than white European and Euro-American workers. In fact, access to large numbers of Mexican workers was a major perk of business, one that city boosters and politicians used uh, to sort of lure businesses and investments to their Western cities. Frank Knapp, an El Paso Chamber of Commerce officer, explained that his city had, quote, always been a reservoir for Mexican labor, end quote. This pool of ready and willing workers was particularly attractive, given that they were, quote, employed at a wage scale that makes the labor change, excuse me, the labor charge for work done only a fraction of that demanded in the East and North, end quote. Knapp went on, touting Mexicans as good workers, perfectly suited for difficult work in strenuous settings. They did what they were told and they didn't complain. He argued, quote, contrary to the general impression prevalent in the North, the Mexican workman is loyal and steady, at least in the United States. Labor trouble, by which he meant unionization um, and pushes for collective bargaining. So he said labor trouble among Mexican laborers has never occurred in El Paso. Now, 
This last point, as historian Monica Perales points out, uh, completely ignores the role of ethnic Mexicans in labor battles throughout the US West up to that point. Nonetheless, Knapp's message was clear. Your business will flourish in El Paso because of an abundance of cheap, exploitable, and docile Mexican laborers. Thus, lacking good wages and working in precarious, often dangerous situations, many ethnic Mexicans struggled to fully provide for their families. Slide. Now, many Mexican Americans assumed that their US citizenship would protect them, would provide a higher standard of living, but they quickly discovered that most employers saw no difference between Mexicans and Mexican Americans. That is, it did not matter to most employers that Mexican Americans were US citizens. From their perspective, all quote Mexicans were the same. Such thinking reflected the racialized structure of labor that was shaped by local prevailing attitudes about the various groups living in any given community. The dominant view was that Mexicans, whether citizen or not, were perpetually foreign and unassimilable. They could never be full Americans and were suited only for certain kinds of work, stoop work, dirty work, underground work, the most dangerous, difficult, and laborious work, work that paid little and required they put their bodies on the line each and every day. And examples of this are on the slide, examples of Latinx workers throughout the US West. Now, this had several implications that contributed to ethnic Mexicans' lack of economic mobility throughout the 20th century. Because citizenship did not matter, wages remain low for both Mexicans and Mexican Americans. From the perspective of many Mexican Americans, it was actually immigrant labor that drove down wages. And so many Mexican Americans understood their own economic troubles as the consequence of increasing numbers of Mexican immigrants in their workplaces and communities. Now this kind of thinking, um, this was rampant once the Bracero program was implemented during World War II. Remember, though this program was created to solve the crisis of labor, uh, of labor shortage during World War II, uh, it actually lasted until 1964. During the years it was in operation, tensions between Mexican Americans, Braceros, and undocumented Mexicans were high, sometimes tipping over the boiling point to violence. One researcher in the mid 1950s found that the majority of Mexican Americans in the Cucamonga, California barrio of Northtown uh, were quote, strongly opposed to the Bracero program and any additional program of its type. This researcher found that the Mexican American men he interviewed believed that the Braceros took their jobs away and drove their wages down. They also disliked the way some of the Braceros worked and blamed them for uh, kind of hoarding the best work assignments. Frank Hernandez, a picker in the Laverne Orange Groves complained, quote, Braceros were difficult because they picked it their way and they were not careful. They would get a bike and start picking before the sun came up, end quote. As historian Matt Garcia explains, angry Mexican-American pickers objected to such behavior since early rising Braceros got to the highest yielding trees first and made the locals look lazy. Such thinking helped drive a wedge between Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants that hindered coalitions between them and limited labor solidarity. Of course, this only benefited big business. Um, it benefited their employers because they desperately wanted to avoid the formation of solidarity among their workers. For them, unions were a major threat to their profit margins. And in this way, competition among and tensions between different Latinxes, some with US citizenship and some without, um, this allowed employers to continue to pit these two groups against each other a reality that kept wages low and opportunities for economic mobility few and far between. US immigration policy has contributed to this dilemma 
by introducing the concepts of the illegal alien. Slide. Born out of the 1924 Immigration Act, the illegal alien became the primary concern of immigration policy and enforcement and reinforced anti-Mexican racism and xenophobia in the Southwest and the entire nation. As historian May Nye has argued, illegal became constitutive of Mexican, referring not to citizens of Mexico, but to a wholly negative racial category which comprised both Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in the United States. Put another way, the legal invention of the category illegal alien developed alongside the institutionalization of a new restrictive immigration regime after 1924, racialized ethnic Mexicans as perpetually foreign and thus illegal. Mexicans and Mexican-Americans alike thus became the quintessential illegal aliens. Other Latinxes, even Puerto Ricans, who are of course US citizens, often experienced the same kind of racialization and otherization once it became the dominant mode of thinking. The 1924 Immigration Act therefore facilitated the maintenance of a racially structured labor force in the US West. This was accomplished by providing employers with two things they wanted. First, an un uninterrupted flow of Mexican laborers and a way to further vilify and exploit these workers. So let me explain. Uh, here on this slide is a popular cartoon from um, early in the 20th century from a, a magazine called Judge Magazine, really getting at the type of anti-immigrant um, xenophobia and racism that was very prevalent in the country by the dawn of the 20th century. And so here you can see Uncle Sam um, really struggling to protect American ideas and institutions from the oncoming tide um, of riffraff, right? The, the undesirables coming in from Europe and other places. And so there's this sense in the early 20th century that too many undesirables, right, are coming to the nation and they are threatening us as Americans, threatening our very institutions. So that is what led eventually to the 1924 Immigration Act. This seminal piece of immigration legislation severely limited the number of immigrants entering the nation by creating a quota system whereby each sending nation was granted a certain quota, uh, a maximum number of people who could migrate to the US. Slide. Policymakers specifically designed this quota system to favor the quote, more desirable Northern and Western Europeans over the quote, less desirable Eastern and Southern Europeans. And of course it completely excluded Asians. Uh, and here on this slide, you can see the first cartoon on the left um, from 1921, uh, kind of an earlier version of the quota system was implemented in 1921. Um, it was expanded and made permanent and made stricter with the 1924 act. But you can see as the, the large number of Europeans sort of coming in and they're getting, they're entering a funnel, right? And only a couple of them get to come out on the other side. So severely limiting the number of Europeans who are coming to the nation, again, in a, in a racist way. Um, and then on the right, uh, just one of many examples of anti-Asian sentiment in the country, um, this one from 1886. Um, so there's a lot of anti-Chinese, anti-Japanese, and eventually anti-Filipino and other anti-Asian sentiment very prevalent in the U.S. West that leads to things like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, really the first step in what becomes a racially restrictive immigration regime. Um, okay, so cutting off Europeans, completely limiting Asians with the 24 Act, However, nations in the Western hemisphere were exempted from the bill, an exemption that Western agribusiness had lobbied hard to win. These employers did not want to see migration from Mexico and other parts of Latin America limited at all. Their capitalist business models depended on paying workers as little as possible. The trope of the illegal alien further enabled them to slot Mexican-Americans into the bottom rungs of local labor hierarchies because it conveyed membership in a group of people deemed, in essence, enemies of the state. 
Such a status justified all kinds of treatment, including intimidation, threats of violence, actual violence, uh, including of a sexual nature, and of course, deportation. The 1924 Act also established the Border Patrol, a state law enforcement body entrusted with police, policing the nation's borders and in practice, its interiors for so-called illegals. And this provided powerful new weapons for Western employers keen on controlling labor and ensuring that their employees worked for poverty wages. Deportation and the threat of deportation became, in very short order, key methods of labor control in an already racialized labor regime that both depended upon and vilified ethnic Mexicans. Over time, of course, U.S. border enforcement grew and transformed in important ways, but always Mexicans and by the 1980s, Central Americans were its prime targets. Today, it is not only deportation and the threat of deportation that keeps Latinx immigrants in line, but also, of course, uh, imprisonment in ICE detention centers, referred to as ICE boxes because they are so cold, uh, and most grievously of all, family separation. These practices referred to as deterrence do not actually stop migrants from coming to the US, but they do reinforce the racialization of Latinxes as illegal aliens, unfit for membership in the nation and deserving of legal and social repression. Slide. Luckily, there is a long history of ethnic Mexicans and other Latinxes challenging such repression and state violence a history that reveals important insights for contemporary immigrant rights movements. And here you can just see the development over the last several decades of this regime in which illegal alien has become a racialized uh, trope, right? A racialized identity for especially ethnic Mexicans. Um, we all know the type of language that is used um, in anti-immigrant language in the last couple of decades. And you can see a couple of examples of this on the slide. So the most comprehensive study, uh, historical study, on ethnic Mexican challenges to U.S. immigration policy and practice is focused on San Diego, California, the busiest port of entry along the U.S.-Mexico border and, in fact, one of the busiest land border crossings in the world. There, starting in the late 1960s, a group of Chican radical Chicanexes organized against what historian Jimmy Patino calls the deportation regime simply an immigration policy based on deportation, one that represented, quote, a systemic force that targeted ethnic Mexicans in its very functioning. These activists were part of the burgeoning Chicanx movement of the late 1960s and 1970s, but they pushed the limits of Chicanx identity and politics by including Mexican immigrants in their community, making non-citizen migrants central to their politicization and social movement organizing. Slide. Like generations of Mexican Americans before them, Chicanx movement participants had to struggle with their relationship to the Mexican immigrants among them. Would they organize around a nationalistic citizen-focused civil rights framework, which tended to exclude Mexican immigrants, or would they form an identity and politics that included their own non-citizen kin, coworkers, and comrades? This was a real debate within Chicanx movement organizations and people came to different answers and they did not always agree. In the early 1970s, these debates came to a head and many Chicanx activists chose to exit civil rights groups um, like CASA, the Center for Autonomous Social Action, MAPA, uh, the Mexican American Political Association and the La Raza Unida Party um, in order to pursue what they saw as more radical, uh, a more radical transnational identity and politics. And so as they organized, they sought greater connections and coalitions with Mexican and other Latinx immigrants. For years, people like Herman Baca, who you can see um, pictured in both images here, he publicized and fought against the violence of the deportation regime as practiced by both the Border Patrol and local law enforcement. In 1975, a National City police officer shot and killed 20-year-old Luis Pato Rivera, a Puerto Rican youth and thus a US citizen. In 
For Baca and his activist peers, there was no clearer evidence of the ways the deportation regime operated in tandem with local law enforcement to racialize, target, harass, and brutalize ethnic Mexicans and other Latinxes than the fact that Rivera was actually a US citizen, right? Uh, yet he was killed because of the way he looked, just like those suspected by border patrol agents of being illegal aliens. The grassroots mobilization that followed Rivera's murder led to the formation in 1976 of the Committee on Chicano Rights, or the CCR, which over the next few years catapulted in prominence and status as they moved to challenge not just the local police and border patrol agents, but the entire emerging national consensus on so-called get tough immigration reform. Their work was invaluable in shaping opposition to the US deportation regime and its attendant racial and class dynamics. CCR activists understood that citizenship would not protect them and that the root of their oppression lay in a racialized economic system that depended upon Latinx labor while simultaneously constructing them as racial others and perpetual foreigners, always already suspicious simply by virtue of looking Mexican, of looking illegal. And so their work reminds us of the fact that immigration as a policy matter and lived reality is also centrally about race. Another important concern for Latinx is, is education. And Mexican Americans have a long history of challenging racist discriminatory actions on behalf of K-12 and college school officials. Slide. Student activists, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about this one. Um, this is just a great image from 1981 uh, from Yolanda Lopez, really challenging the entire construction, the entire idea of this um, illegal alien, right? And pointing out that, um, you know, that they are the original inhabitants of this land. Slide. So student activism in particular has had a long and lasting impact on American society. The Mexican-American student walkouts of the late 1960s and early 1970s dramatized for the nation, uh, indeed the world, that dis the dissatisfaction, frustration, and anger many Mexican-American young people experienced in their schools. Now, as I wrote about in my white paper, they were fed up with all sorts of practices in the schools, racist teachers, indifferent teachers, counselors that, um, you know, instructed them to go into vocational labor, tracking programs, all of these things. Um, they also wanted culturally relevant education. They wanted history courses, other social studies courses, art and music courses that provided them with an education they could relate to. One that celebrated Latinx societal contributions, one that explained their lived realities and helped them realize their true potential. So in short, they wanted an emancipatory education. And these demands were nothing short of radical in a society determined to hold them back. Now these students' efforts led to um, some immediate victories. In some places, school districts were more responsive than in others and conceded that they needed to hire more Mexican-American employees. Others instituted elective courses in Chicanx history, and in other cases, student demands for bilingual bicultural education led to the inclusion of these kinds of programs in court orders that attempted to redress segregation and other forms of discrimination. But student protesters also inspired others, including their parents and other family members, inspired them that something needed to change in this sense, they convinced growing numbers of ethnic Mexicans and other Latinxes to get involved, to join social and civic organizations working for the betterment of their communities. Some historians, in fact, credit the student walkouts with igniting the broader Chicanx movement. All of that said, though, I believe that the true significance of the Chicanx student walkouts is more long term. We can see the legacies of these efforts today all over our educational system and in broader American society. More Latinx youth graduated high school and went to college than before the walkouts. More became various kinds of professionals, lawyers, doctors, social workers, teachers, and others, uh, thus contributing to upward social mobility. Others having been politicized by the walkouts 
went on to lead social justice organizations in their communities. Now, students continue to utilize the school walkout as a legitimate protest method, one that continues to resonate with large swaths of US society. In recent years, we have seen young people walk out of class to protest gun violence and the lack of action being taken to combat it, climate change, anti-gay and anti-trans rules and laws, racist, sexist, and transphobic dress codes, uh, bans on ethnic studies, anti-immigrant policies, and most recently, the rollback of Roe v. Wade. And it was the actions of Chicanx students in the late 1960s and 1970s that put this protest tactic on the map and paved the way for generations of youth seeking to have their voices heard. There are other long-term legacies. College programs in Chicanx Latinx studies are the direct result of the 1968 East LA walkouts and others like it. Widespread support for diverse curriculums that include Latinx histories and cultures, um, support that has grown steadily since the 1960s has led to important revisions in social studies standards and advanced placement courses. There is of course more work to be done. Slide. This work has been more comprehensive in some states more than others. Texas, for example, is notorious for revising social studies standards in ways that are exclusionary and tend to reinforce traditional notions of American exceptionalism. Of course, we all remember the attacks in Arizona on the Tucson Unified School District's Mexican American Studies program, which in 2010 culminated in the passage of uh, Arizona House Bill 2281, which outlawed curriculum um, that they said, you know, promoted the overthrow of the U.S. government, promoted resentment of certain people, um, advocated ethnic solidarity. Um, clearly, this was a racially modified, uh, modified attempt to make illegal a program that since its origins in the 1970s had been raising the educational attainment and achievement of Mexican American students in Tucson. So I know I'm, I'm out of time. And so I, I have some other things to say about this, especially most recent critiques on so-called critical race theory. Um, but I want to sort of save that for the question and answer section if you do have those comments. But the one point I wanted to make is that the ability to teach and learn about these critical subjects will be essential for the future of Latinxes in the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Olden. Now we're going to turn to the uh, presentation on demography and uh, Doug Massey has provided us with a recording that we're going to show now. I actually, sorry, do not think I can share audio. So Robbie, can you can you share the the video? Yeah, I'll bring it up. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hello everyone, I'm sorry I can't be there in person to give this presentation, but it did coincide with my 50th high school reunion and I did want to go. Uh, in any event, let's talk about Latinos in the West. First thing to know about Latinos in the West are, is that they are the oldest um, and largest uh, Latino population in, in the country, going back clear to the beginning of the 17th century. So you can see from the chart, um, back the first settlement was founded in North America in, uh, in 1600, had about 700 Spaniards settling in what is today New Mexico. And over the decades, that grew steadily to a peach of population of about 60,000 by 1850, two years after the uh, annexation of the northern part of Mexico into the United States. And they, these people were the, entered the United States and suddenly became American citizens. Uh, Latino presence in the West also goes back to uh, 1769 in the state of California, 
uh, California was settled much later by Spaniards compared to New Mexico. And uh, even at the 1821 in Mexican independence, it only had 21,000, 22,000 uh, uh, Spaniard inhabitants in, in California uh, compared to um, 28,000 in, um, in New Mexico. And rather than increase after uh, after the by the time the United States uh, 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 annexed California, the the Latino population had actually decreased, whereas it had increased in New Mexico. So the circumstances of Mex New Mexico and California are quite different. And the circumstances of the West compared to other parts of the country are quite different because of the well-established Latino population in what's today known as New Mexico. <clears throat> So here's the Latino population in the four census region as of 1850, the first census after the 1848 accession of the of the northern 40 percent of Mexico into the United States. So you can see it's by far the largest Latino population. The next closest is, is the South, and there almost all the population is in Texas, and very small populations in what are now what is now the Midwest and the Northeast. Here we see the growth in the Latino populations of the United States starting in 1850, uh, moving up to the present. And so you see that in 1850, there were very small numbers, uh, and that was common across the board, uh, with the largest being in on, uh, the West, but still rather small numbers. And then beginning around the early 1900s, the West and the South began to pull away from the rest of the census regions. And then after uh, 1950, the West pulls away from the rest of the regions and close by is the south and uh, they both grow until they about, uh, become very close together and, and approximately merge by the year 2020 with about 23.8 million uh, Latinos in the west and 23.4 million in the in the south. Uh, the northeast comes in a distance a third with 8.4 million and the smallest is in midwest with 5.5 5.6 million Latinos. This shows the regional distribution of the Latino population from 1850 to 2020. You can see that uh, back in the early part of the uh, in the middle of the 19th century, the uh, the largest portion of Latinos were in was in the West, uh, and it, the West reached its, its maximum uh, density uh, about uh, uh, 1860, with a 70 percent of all Latinos living in the West compared to 20% in the South, small percentages in the Midwest and Northeast. Uh, the West steadily declined uh, through uh, uh, the early, into the early 20th century. And, um, and the um, South comes to its largest percentage in uh, 1910. And then the Midwest and the Northeast begin to grow. Midwest, the Northeast reaches its highest percentage in, in 1970. And since then, it's really been a decline in both uh, in, in the Northeast and uh, a slight increase in the Midwest and, and substantial increases in uh, the South and uh, a slow declines in, in the West. So that the West and the South are about equal, relatively small percentage of Latinos live in the Midwest and about 14% uh, in the Northeast. Here you can see that the growth of the Latino population in the West is really a story of California and the rest of the Western states with a huge growth in California's Latino population beginning to pull away from the rest of the region around 1940 and then steadily increasing to the 1940s, accelerating in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, clear up to the year 2010 when it slows down a bit as uh, migration is redirected to uh, other parts of the country. Uh, after the militarization of the Cal California Mexico border, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, the West uh, was it along at a very slow pace until 1970. There's an acceleration and a big acceleration in the in the um, after 1990 up to the present. And this looks at the rest of the uh, states in the in the Western region, uh, aside from California. You can see that Arizona is uh, by far the biggest now, followed by Colorado, then the state of Washington, then the state of New Mexico, then the state of Nevada, then Oregon and Utah, and then down towards the bottom are Idaho and Hawaii. At the very bottom 
with the populations in the tens of thousands rather than the hundreds of thousands or millions are Alaska, Montana, and Wyoming. Uh, Arizona and, uh, and New Mexico and Colorado are quite similar uh, through most of their uh, in the early 20th century up until around 1960. And then uh, uh, the New Mexican population slows down uh, and the uh, Colorado's population lags and Arizona's begins to pick up and climbs during the 1970s and 1980s. And then when the Operation uh, Gatekeeper is launched in Southern California to block um, the pathway northward for undocumented migrants uh, in after 1994, there's a huge surge in migration through the state of Arizona, uh, uh, through the Sonoran Desert into the state of Arizona and leading to a large settlement of Latinos in that population in, in that state. And it's now uh, 2.2 million Latinos in Arizona, uh, followed distantly by, by Colorado, and the rest of them spread out below that. Here you can see the total dominance of, of California compared to other states in the West, uh, with about almost 16 million people. The next closest, as we saw, was Arizona, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and the state of Washington, and the others are, are much farther behind California but nonetheless with significant populations in the hundreds of thousands. Here we get a very different picture when we look at the relative number of Latinos. Here we see the percentage Latino in the Western states. And if you take a predominance in the population, the, the largest relative population of Latinos is in New Mexico, where they're almost a half of the population, 47.7, 48% or so. Uh, and they're followed by California, and then next is uh, Nevada, which has a relatively small population compared to those other two states. But uh, in relative terms, Latinos are a larger proportion of the population in Nevada and then Colorado. And then some of the more recently settled states, Oregon, Utah, Washington state, uh, and then the smaller states. Uh, here we see the national origins that read of, of, of uh, Latinos uh, in the West. And as we, we see, it's always been dominated by Mexicans, very strongly dominated by Mexican presence. Initially, it was overwhelmingly right after the annexation of, of, of Mexico. And then by 1970, uh, it was Mexicans constituted for 80 to 88 percent of the population. That went down into the 70s, back up into the 80s, and back down into the 70s. So till by 2020, it's about 77 percent of the population. So it's been between 75 and 80 percent of the population for most of the of the past 40 years. Uh, Central Americans have grown a bit. Uh, other Latinos, which is a grab bag, grab bag of different origins, has varied. Uh, South Americans hasn't been very big. What's notable is this very small presence of Cubans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. There just are not many Caribbean origin Hispanics in the Western states at all. Uh, most of the population dynamics come from immigration, uh, especially in the 1970s and 80s. You can see this in the percentage foreign born among Latinos, where the percentage foreign born goes up between 1970 and 1980, stays very high, and, and then goes down slowly uh, over time as the, as, you know, as, as the births begin to take the bigger part of the, account for a bigger part of population growth and immigration continues, but slows down eventually. Uh, and you can see that uh, it's really affecting uh, Central Americans and South Americans, especially uh, also Dominicans, but they're very small in number. Mexicans were already a large population, so the arrival of immigrants didn't change uh, the foreign born to that extent because they were coming into a large population that was heavily native born. But it did steadily rise to about 41% in year 2000 before declining. Um, the immigration into the West, uh, especially during the 1980s and 1990s, uh, really changed the generational composition of Latinos in the pop in the Western population. Oops. Uh, in uh, 1970, what we had was a Latino population that was really descendant mostly from immigrants who had come into the country during the 1920s. The the the, the flood tide of, of Mexican immigration uh, occurred in the 1920s, where the rate of out-migration from Mexico was higher then than in the 1980s or 1980s as a percentage of Mexico's population. And the population grew dramatically uh, during the 1920s. Uh, and 
Uh, then, of course, the population growth stopped. It was cut off after 1929 when the Depression hit. The deportation campaigns ran from 1929 to 1934. Uh, and those that remained uh, in the United States basically uh, uh, began to have uh, the second and third generations begin to be born. Uh, and there was very little settled immigration in the 1930s or 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and so by 1970, what you had was a first generation that had come in largely in the 1920s and was get very old, uh, aging uh, out of the population. And the second generation that consisted of adults born in the 1940s, 1930s and 1940s, and a very young third generation of of Latinos that uh, was really part of the baby boom. Uh, and then flash forward to 1994, you see a very different composition has been created by immigration in the interim. And now we have a huge first generation that arrived since 1970. And the second generation uh, was, was, was very, consisted of mostly young children who, uh, who were born to the first generation in recent years. And what third generation was um, this old third generation or now older people uh, in, in, in aging out of the population. And this create, this this configuration remained uh, pretty much stable from 1994 through 2010. Now we're seeing uh, an increase in the third generation and second generation again and shrinkage of the first generation with the slowdown in immigration that occurred between 2010 and 2020. And the slowdown and immigration was especially pronounced for Mexicans and particularly for undocumented Mexicans, where between 2008 and 2018, the flow of undocumented migrants from Mexico to the United States was actually net negative. And then um, both the undocumented population fell and the overall population of Mexican born people in the United States also fell. And you can really see this in the West. Uh, with the surge in immigration during the 1980s, you naturally have a surge in speaking of Spanish at home, and you can see all, all the main po bigger populations, Central America, South Americans, and Mexicans. There's a big bump upward speaking Spanish. And unlike the percentage foreign born, it doesn't drop very rapidly because of in first and second generation households that dominate the population, there's still a lot of Spanish being spoken, and it's still being spoken at high levels 77% for Central Americans, and about 63, 62% for Mexicans and South Americans. As uh, with immigration, you also get a drop in the percentage of citizens in the, among the populations. The drop is less for Mexicans because originally the population in 1970 was dominated by citizens, uh, and, but it did drop. <clears throat> there were smaller numbers of Central Americans and South Americans present uh, in 1970 in the West. And of course, it dropped much further. The Dominicans were a small population to begin with, and that still is the true. Still is true. So any entries of Dominicans really pumped it down. But thereafter, percentage of U.S. citizens rose, both because of births and because of naturalizations. And naturalizations especially increased after 1980 and the 1990s, when, um, particularly in the United States, uh, you, the legislation uh, increased the penalties for not being a U.S. citizen and it increased the risk to Latinos immigrants for not being citizens, uh, while Mexican, Mexico authorized uh, the uh, dual citizenship for the first time in history. And this prompted a huge wave of naturalizations that really increased the percentage of Mer uh, American citizens among in the Mexican population especially. And uh, among those who are citizens, uh, a very large share had always had always been uh, registered to to vote between 65 and 83 uh, percent back in 1996. We don't get this information starting until 1996, so we don't have the same decadal uh, transition to look at. But you can see that by 2020, very fairly high shares of Latinos are registered to vote of citizens, uh, ranging from about 70 to 85 uh, percent, and not a big difference between the various groups. And among those who are registered, there's always been a fairly high level of voting, but by 1920, it was extremely high, ranging from 88 to 100 percent for some of the groups. Uh, so there's a over time, there was a large political mobilization, policy changes in Washington and in Mexico City uh, brought about a, a surge in naturalizations. And so there, there's a lot more citizens, a lot more citizens registered and a lot more citizens uh, who are registered voting. Over time, the percentage of college graduates has steadily increased. It went down in, for some of the populations uh, 
uh, during the immigration years as lower or less educated immigrants arrived in the United States to push the average down, especially in small populations like Dominicans. Uh, uh, but over time, our Saint College graduate has gone steadily up. And by 1920, it was highest for South Americans at 43%, followed by Dominicans at 35, Cubans at 30, 33%, Puerto Ricans at 30, other Latinos at 25.5, and down at the bottom are Central Americans at 16.4, and Mexicans at 14.5. So they lag behind the other groups. Uh, here's median household incomes for the various populations. We see a similar pattern um, also traceable to, uh, to immigration. So they start out at a fairly high level, and then the immigrants arrive and pull the wages down, the average incomes down, they go back up. And then uh, in the 1990s, there's a bit of a lag. And then there's a, a, a pretty uh, a, a flat between 2000 and 2010. But after between 2010 and 2020, we see a, a climb uh, or an increase across all the different groups to until by uh, 19, uh, 2020, we see that Dominicans are the highest, and uh, and um, South Americans, uh, Central South and South South Americans and Central Americans are next highest, but they're all bunched up between sixty and eighty three thousand. Median home values for Latinos in the West follow the West Coast um, housing markets. Uh, fairly low in the nineteen seventies, and a big uptick between uh, in the nineteen eighties. 1990s, then a bit of a downturn during the 1990s, and then uh, another burst in housing values from 2000, uh, uh, 2000 to 2020, uh, with home values ranging from $340,000 to about $459,000. And when you multiply the percentage of homeowners by the percentage of, by, by the median Household, uh, household uh, value, you get an estimate of potential home wealth. It's the wealth that would be accrued by the group if they all had paid paid off their mortgages and uh, at the end of their life cycles had done this. Uh, and you can see that percent potential wealth is greatest for South Americans, followed by Cubans, uh, followed by Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, uh, and with, sorry about that, with Mexicans and Central Americans lagging behind. Now we get to the Latino populations in specific metropolitan areas. One of the things that's characteristic about the West is the widespread settlement of Latinos throughout the throughout the region and across the states. There are so many cities with significant Latino populations compared to other regions, especially the Midwest and Northeast. Uh, and of course, in California, it's dominated by Los Angeles with over six million Latinos, followed by Riverside. San Diego, San Francisco, Fresno, and going on down to um, very small populations. These these are all the cities and metro areas in California with at least 30,000 30, Latinos. And Chico, um, Chico meaning small, uh, is aptly named as the smallest Latino population of, of these. Uh, and we can see the real influence of agriculture in the distribution of of Latinos across the metropolitan areas of California. Latinos have always been a fundamental part of the of the agricultural industry, the main main labor force for agriculture since the 1930s. And hence you get the presence of all these agricultural farm towns and farm bases like Fresno, Bakersfield, Oxnard, Stockton, Visalia, Modesto, Salinas, Merced, El Centro, uh, uh, Madera, uh, San Luis Obispo, and Napa, of course, for the for the wineries, and you see uh, this influence also in other parts of of, of the West. Uh, with uh, uh, these, are, oh, this is the percent Latino in these metropolitan areas, and you can again see the real influence of Latinos in these um, farm towns. So El Centro, Merced, Visalia, Madera, Bakersfield, Salinas, Hanford, all these farm towns are majority Latino. Uh, and of course, majority Mexican, as we'll see, Stockton, and so on, and uh, and so it, again, it's really obvious that there's a a big influence of the agricultural workforce on the regional distribution of Latinos, and you can even see it outside of California, with um, in places like Wenatchee, Washington, 
and where is it? Yakima, Washington. These are two farm towns with fr fruit industries, apples and cherries. And uh, the Latinos have long been, and Mexicans have long been the main main labor force for in, in, in the orchards in Eastern Washington. But you, here we see the large populations in Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas, Denver, in Seattle, and Albuquerque, Tucson, uh, moving, moving down to very small numbers. When you get to Anchorage, and Anchorage, uh, Alaska, 35,000 uh, uh, there, and um, Eugene, Oregon, 39,000, Honolulu, 102,000. Uh, so well, there's a wide range of population sizes throughout the West. Uh, and again, when you look at the percentage Latino, you, uh, you get a very different picture with Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is really on the border, uh, having a high percentage of Latinos. Yuma, which is right on the Mexican, it's on the border with Mexico and California, uh, right at, at that junction. Uh, and then the farm towns, Yakima, Washington, and Wenatchee, Washington, are, have very high levels. <clears throat> Las Vegas, the, the gambling industry, the casino industry, was a big draw for uh, Latino immigrants in the 1980s and 1990s, especially from Mexico. And you see um, they're about a third of the population in Las Vegas now. And moving on down, the, the lowest levels are in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and Spokane, Washington, in the single digits. Um, from As we saw throughout the West, uh, Mexicans dominate the population by far. The largest share of, the, of Latinos are are Mexicans, uh, Mexican origin, but there are uh, some cities with that are, have a, a, a more diverse Latino population, mainly the large metropolitan areas. So you can see here in San Francisco, only 62% are Latino, and you also and you have large populations of of, of Central Americans and South Americans and um, uh, other Latinos as well. <clears throat> um, so uh, and that and Los Angeles. It's also Central Americans. It's the second largest, uh, and other other places like Santa Rosa and uh, Vallejo in the Bay Area also have a, a, a larger number. But the farm towns are really overwhelmingly Mexican: Chico, Fresno, Hag Hag Hanford, uh, Napa, uh, Modesto, uh, Merced, Madera. Heavily Mexican because of the farm farm workers. And in the other parts of the West, we see that in general, Mexicans still dominate, but there are large exceptions. One well, of the biggest exception is in Honolulu. Uh, and that's because of the history of Latino migration to uh, Hawaii. Hawaii uh, and uh, Puerto Rico came into U.S. control at about the same time. And Hawaii began its uh, 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 territory as history as a U.S. territory as an agriculture area growing sugar and, and pineapples and um and uh, to bring in a workforce of puerto ricans were originally the the the, the founding um, ethnicity of latinos in in hawaii they were brought in as a to work in the sugar fields uh coming from puerto rico where sugar was cultivated they uh, uh they were heavily recruited by growers in hawaii as a skilled labor force in for sugar uh sugar production uh, uh, and then um, Santa Fe is another big exception, and here it's the other Hispanics, and these are the descendants of the of the Spanish immigrants from the from the 16 and 1700s, who really kept had to set their own separate uh, uh, Hispano culture uh, that was distinct from uh, other cultures in the region, and uh, and they still see themselves as not necessarily Mexicans or or any other group, but really. Are really native native Hispanos, native Latinos in the United States, and and, and their origin is is there is unique to themselves. And you see that also in other parts of the West, particularly in Santa Fe as well. Uh, uh, so that's those are the two big exceptions with the the, the Albuquerque, uh, Santa Fe, and uh, and 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 uh, other places, Pueblo, Colorado. And this is these are the places where this um, descendants of the original settlers in New Mexico live today. <clears throat> and here you can see the percentage of Latinos in different populations. And these are the four largest uh, metropolitan Latino populations. In general, they started in California. They start from a small percentages, 
uh, beginning because of the massive inf inflow of, of Anglo-American migrants during the gold rush and, and, the, uh, and the rapid economic development of California. Uh, and they don't begin to grow till the immigration of the 1920s, especially in, in, in Riverside, there's a huge increase in, in, um, in the Latino population during the 1920s, then it, and the depression hits and there's deportations and they go down. And then they begin to rise again in the 1960s and 1970s uh, to the point where um, Riverside is now majority Latino. Los Angeles is almost majority Latino. San Diego is about a third of the population is Latino and Phoenix is almost a third as well. San Francisco is the lowest with 22%. Uh, in other metropolitan areas, you see a distinct, differently pattern, different patterns. So, uh, in um, uh, in uh, Tucson and in Albuquerque, uh, Latinos were majority at, still in 19, 1900. And as those developed and Anglo Americans moved in, these the percentages went down, bottomed out around 1960. And then have uh, edged back upwards to Albuquerque is almost half Latino again, and Tucson is about 37% Latino. Denver was never had a very high percentage, and it began to grow in the 70s and accelerated after the uh, and after 1990. And here you see the smaller cities uh, still with relatively small percentages of Latinos, uh, and they began growing after 1970 as well. So now let's turn to segregation patterns. Uh, this is the index of dissimilarity, where an index of 60 and above is considered to be high, 30 to 60 is considered to be moderate, and below 30 is low. And we can see that in uh, between in the 1970s, uh, Los Angeles went from moderate towards the high level of segregation across the threshold in 1990, and has been above 60 uh, since then. Uh, uh, San Francisco also increased at this time, uh, and then went down. Uh, Riverside has been fairly stable with the worst upward in the 1990s. So basically, we see these large uh, cities in the upper reaches of the moderate range and into the high range with Los Angeles. And these are uh, Latino white segregation in other metropolitan areas in the West. And again, you see Tucson was relatively high to 50 and going down. Uh, in general, there's been a uh, constriction in the variation. So there's a wide variation here as things are happening, migration and whatnot. And then they, they're converging on a level between 30 and 45, which is basically in the lower half of the of the moderate range. So not, not a very high level of segregation. And um, this is the spatial isolation, which is the, how isolated they are within neighborhoods. And it gives the percentage Latino in the neighborhood of the average Latino. So you can see that as Los Angeles population grew, the percentage of Latinos grew, the Latinos became more isolated in neighborhoods and, and by uh, the year 2000, but the average Latino lived in the neighborhood of 63%, 64% Latino. Phoenix now, um, uh, or Riverside is, uh, Riverside is about 60, the average Latino lives in the neighborhood is about, uh, about 60% Latino. And in, in, in Phoenix, it's uh, up to 46%. And in um, San Francisco, it's up to 48%. It's relatively, oh, no, that's San Diego, sorry. San Diego's about 48%. That's relatively low in San Francisco, only about 32%, as the Mission District gets um, um, a lot, uh, increasingly gentrified. <clears throat> Spatial isolation in other metropolitan areas. Fresno has gone from minority to majority status of Latinos. Albuquerque has been around. Uh, just above uh, 50% for a long time, only dipping below for, for a few years here. Uh, Tucson is just at, uh, roughly at 50%. Uh, Denver uh, is increased and is now at about 37%. Salt Lake City, about 29%. Portland and Seattle, uh, 19 and 15% respectively. Finally, we turn to the spatial concentration of poverty. Segregation matters because it effect, affects the degree to which um, uh, people are confined to, it, it affects the distribution of neighborhood advantage and disadvantage uh, and tends to concentrate whatever the characteristics of the population being segregated are. So if there's a high rate of poverty, it concentrates poverty. If there's a high rate of affluence, it concentrates affluence. And what we see here is the spatial concentration of poverty. And this is a typical pattern for um, the United States going down in the 1970s, up in the 1980s, remaining fairly high, and then dropping um, 
uh, after the year 2000 to 2010. 2010. We do not have data for 2020 yet, so these data series all stop at 2010. They won't be ready for another couple of years before we can get 2020 data. Um, and this is this spatial concentration of poverty for Latinos and other areas. In general, a spatial concentration of poverty above 20 is considered to be high, 40 is considered to be extreme. And as you can see in this and the, in the prior uh, uh, one, none of these are extreme. They're in the, they're in the high but not extreme ranges of, of poverty concentration. And now we look at the concentration of affluence. And affluence, uh, this is the percentage affluent in the neighborhood of the average affluent Latino. You can see in San Francisco, Latinos who happen to be affluent live in relatively affluent neighborhoods with 48% of their neighbors are also affluent. San Diego, 41% are also affluent. And 37% uh, of of those in um, Los Angeles are affluent, and finally Phoenix, 34%. And we see there was an increase in the 70s, moderation in the, two th in the 1980s and 1990s, and then there's been really a sharp increase in the concentration of affluence, as there has been nationwide for rich people increasingly are living in, in neighborhoods with other rich people and not coming into contact with poor or moderate income people. And you see even a more pronounced pattern here, the same thing with an increase, a decline, and then a sharp increase during the 2000s. And this reflects, this is the spatial manifestation of the increase in income inequality. As you increase income inequality, that gets played out spatially and leads to higher concentrations of poverty on the low end and higher concentrations of affluence at the high end. And uh, put everything into context, this shows you the concentration of poverty for whites, blacks, whites, blacks, and Latinos in the metropolitan areas we just looked at. And in general, we see a progression of white having the lowest concentration of poverty, uh, Latinos in between, and, and Blacks at the highest. That's especially true in Fresno, uh, uh, and, and but in some areas, uh, um, Latinos actually have the highest concentration of poverty, as in Phoenix, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, and in Tucson, they have they're more con the average uh, poor Latino lives in the neighborhood is about a third, 30, 32 percent um, uh, poor. Uh, poor in, in in Tucson, and the average black lives in is about 31% poor. Uh, San Francisco, uh, by far, blacks have by far the highest level of, of concentrated poverty. And then when we look at concentration and affl affluence, we see that San Francisco Bay Area is really polarized economically. The average white person lives in a neighborhood where 58% of the population is also affluent. For, for Latinos, it's 50.6. And for um, blacks, it's 47.9. That's very high for blacks. In most most areas, blacks never get that high. Riverside is another exception, uh, and blacks are uh, actually tied with them, um, with whites for concentration of, of affluence. Uh, Los Angeles whites have a much higher concentration of affluence than either blacks or Latinos. Uh, Denver whites stand out. Uh, Albuquerque, uh, and you can see the big difference. Whites are invariably uh, uh, in the lead or close to the lead. So um, that's all the information I have to present. I hope I haven't gone too long. Uh, and the main points are that there's a huge uh, diversity throughout the West. The Latino population in the West is the oldest in the country, uh, and it's been there for a long time. It's become becoming more and more diverse over time, uh, and uh, and uh, it's it's a highly variable population that's hard to generalize. At the regional level, you really have to go to different metropolitan areas and see about what the local conditions are. So uh, I hope I've helped inform the rest of the conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate all that interesting demographic research. And now we're going to turn to Tom Sines to help us understand the law and policy landscape in the West. And Tom, just feel free to take as long as you need and I'll just trim back the scenario building discussion. We definitely want to hear from you in full. Well, thank you, Rachel. I, I am tempted. I know we're behind time to uh, do the lawyer trick and uh, say I'll forego oral argument and submit on the papers, but I will go for a bit. Uh, what is in the paper that I've titled A Selective Review of the Development of Latino Civil Rights in California and the Western United States? So I first want to begin by explaining that the selection bias uh, in this selective review is entirely based on my own experience. Uh, that includes studying the case of Mendez versus Westminster 
school district and Hernandez versus Texas, uh, going back to my college days in, in the mid 1980s. But it also includes obviously uh, my 25 years of work as a civil rights attorney at MALDEF, uh, 12 years beginning in 1993. And then the last 13 years, I've had the great, great honor of leading MALDEF as its president and general counsel. Uh, many of you know that. I'm so happy to see that our group today includes uh, some clients. It includes some co-counsel. It includes some former expert witnesses. It includes some former board members. It includes some current staff members. Uh, it includes some informants uh, on issues in, in different states. Uh, so I, I hope that you all, good friends, understand the selection bias in, in what is in the paper. Uh, I join you today from San Antonio, Texas, where MALDEF was founded. I'm here for uh, our gala fundraiser this evening, more about Texas in a moment, because I do not want to spend a lot of time going over what's in the paper. I do want to take some of what is suggested there and nationalize it, if you will, because I know we're going to be having a discussion about the future and uh, what has happened in California and Arizona and the West uh, may presage what is going to happen in the rest of the country as the rest of the country catches up with the West in terms of its Latino population. So my select review does attempt to go over what has happened in the West with a focus on California. I'm a lifelong Californian and Arizona because of those are the two states in my definition of the West that have the largest uh, Latino populations and have uh, throughout history. Uh, my definition of the West, I know it does differ from what may have been used by the others who relied on census regions. So my definition as a lawyer of the West is the federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. What that means is it does exclude some important states that might be an other's definition of the West for the Latino community like Colorado, like New Mexico, like Utah in particular. So I have focused only on the Ninth Circuit states, which is basically uh, Arizona and the coast, um, and not included discussion of some of those other states, including, of course, the all important state of Texas where I am today, but I will comment on that in a moment. The paper does go over uh, the pre civil rights era in order to help to establish first theme, which is that California, and in particular Latino civil rights in California, have throughout our history have been precursors, trendsetters of civil rights developments for all communities nationwide. That began in the pre-civil rights era with a number of cases that anticipated and predated later U.S. Supreme Court precedent in important areas like restrictive covenants, uh, like access to public accommodations, and perhaps most prominently like school segregation in the Mendez case. That pre-civil rights era, particularly in Mendez, also presages another constant issue in Latino civil rights nationwide, and that is struggling with the issue of Latinos, Mexican Americans as a race or as another definition of an other group. That's still an issue of contention today in the law. As you know, the Census Bureau is once more teeing up uh, a discussion and consideration by the Office of Management and Budget about whether the census and other federal data collection should unify the question on Hispanic origin and race to a single question, thus making Latino identity on a par with other racial groups for the first time since 1930 under the census. Uh, the pre-civil rights discussion with the Mendez case recognizes that California has other parts of the country struggled even back then with acknowledging a previous history of racializing the Mexican community and actually putting that racialization of the Mexican American community into statutory law that was basically ignored in the Mendez case, for example. I then go to the civil rights era when the US Supreme Court caught up through Brown and the cases around Brown and after it to where California had been, at least with respect to Latino you know, civil rights, at a formal legal level from much earlier. And I point out that, again, California is a trendsetter, anticipating some of the civil rights battles, debates that we continue to have today, including the area of affirmative action with the Bakke case 
as you all know, the Supreme Court in November will be hearing argument on affirmative action challenges against Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Given the current Supreme Court, that may be uh, the end of affirmative action as we know it across the country. Uh, that battle, of course, began formally with the Bakke case in front of the US Supreme Court. Also point out California's role on other issues of critical importance nationwide, including bilingual education, the education rights of Latinos and others to equitable systems of funding, for example, and California's role in anticipating other critical issues of importance today. I spend much of the paper talking about the notorious 90s in California, uh, when we saw a spasm of anti-Latino legislating, primarily, though not exclusively, through the voter initiative process, beginning, of course, in 1994 with the now infamous Proposition 187, followed by Proposition 209, an anti-affirmative action measure that was often portrayed then and now in the media as primarily relating to the Black community. I think there's a very strong argument that, in fact, the focus of Pete Wilson and Ward Connerly, the two chief, chief proponents of Proposition 209, was actually the growing Latino community. And finally, was followed in 1998 by Proposition 227, which sought to enforce and did for many years until it was recently repealed uh, by voters in California, sought to enforce an English-only rule in public education, including for English learners. I point out then that the neighboring state of Arizona, having reached a similar plateau of Latino representation in the population, a similar threshold, uh, saw a terrible year of 2010, obviously not confined to 2010, uh, as uh, Petra could certainly tell us all, uh, but really saw a manifestation in 2010 of more anti-Latino lawmaking in the form of Arizona's own initiative to implement an affirmative action ban, but more most famously by SB 1070, an anti-immigrant law that sought to deputize all law enforcement agents in Arizona to enforce federal immigration law with all of the consequent discrimination that we had already seen in Arizona through Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his actions. And also, perhaps even more ominously, in light of what's going on today, Arizona's, if you will, trend-setting ban on ethnic studies that, although it ultimately was struck down, obviously was a precursor to the current debate and lawmaking we see across the country targeting or purporting to target critical race theory, but really seeking to limit the K-12 curriculum to eliminate stories about all people of color, but I would say in particular Latinos in light of the now prevalent replacement theory, quote unquote, uh, that is rampant in our politics. I assert that a lot of what is behind this and what is behind what I call in the paper the California paradox, which I'll explain in a minute, is the long legs, the long effects of demographic fear, namely the fear that the growth of minority communities, but here in the West, but throughout the country, particularly the growth of the Latino community is somehow a threat to the continued traditions, continued culture, continued politics of the contemporary United States. That demographic fear we have seen exploited by some political leaders in California in the 90s by folks like Pete Wilson. Uh, like Ron Unz, like Ward Connerly. Also in Arizona, some 15 years later in 2010, an exploitation of demographic fear of the growth of the Latino community through SB 1070, the others by folks like Jan Brewer and Russell Pierce. And as I mentioned previously, Sheriff Cho Arpaio. I assert that that demographic fear has a mirror effect on more progressive allies who I believe I really believe they're consciously advised to avoid speaking to the Latino community as a racial group, as a racialized community, in order to avoid inadvertently provoking the demographic fear that they have seen exploited by the other 
side of the political spectrum because it triggering that demographic fear they believe will result in votes against them. That I believe in results in folks like Governor Gavin Newsom avoiding speaking to the Latino community as a racial group, as a racialized group, an avoidance that does not apply to other racial minorities in California where he has spoken directly to Native American grievance with an apology in the beginning of his terms as a governor, the black community whom he has spoken to directly, particularly in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder and the Asian American community that he has spoken to directly as a racial group in light of the increase in hate crimes against the Asian American community as a result uh, of the pandemic and its characterization by Trump and others. So this avoidance of highlighting Latinos as a racial group, a racialized group, uh, leads to the California paradox where we have perhaps some of the most progressive policies and laws in the country, including laws that benefit the growing Latino community, but we have an unprecedented level of underrepresentation comparing population to representation and leadership positions unprecedented and not faced by other communities. In the paper, I give examples related to the California Supreme Court, which throughout its history has never had more than one Latino justice at a time. Other smaller racial groups have had many more. The white community for most of the history of the California Supreme Court had seven justices, the full court complement at a time. A few short years ago, there were four Asian Americans on the California Supreme Court at the same time. And next year, with the seating of the new justices, there will be three black justices on the Supreme Court at the same time. There will be two openly LGBT justices on the Supreme Court at the same time. And even though she is now Chief Justice, we are still confined to one Latino at a time on the California Supreme Court. The other example that I gave was the effects of a progressive policy, namely a law that required until it was predictably struck down in court that required California based publicly traded corporations to include women on their boards. And the Latino Corporate Directors Association assessed the effects and that law resulted in appointments of more white women more black women, more Asian American women than Latino women. Latino women were fourth in their appointments to those boards as a result of that progressive California law. That paradox, positive policy, underrepresentation is a serious one that I think we have to grapple with. And here, let me take my conclusions that were confined to the West in the paper and try to nationalize them. As I mentioned, I'm here in San Antonio, Texas, where California, was, where MALDEF was founded. And you all may have seen that about two weeks ago, the Census Bureau recognized that Texas has become the third state following New Mexico and notably California eight years ago in Latinos being the largest racial group in the population of Texas. Two weeks ago, the Census Bureau acknowledged that Latinos had likely now surpassed whites in the population of Texas to become the largest racial group. As I mentioned, we passed that milestone in California some eight years ago, which makes the underrepresentation that I talked about so much more stark. Interestingly, of course, that development in, Cal in Texas may ultimately lead to similar effects in the politics of Texas. We all have been anticipating for a very not large number of years a shift in Texas. Hasn't happened yet. It may happen because of that demographic change. I will, as a, a, an aside, note that former President Barack Obama likes to point out that if Latino voter turnout in Texas matched turnout in California, he used to say as of two weeks ago, he was using Colorado as the example, that if Latino turnout in Texas mirrored that of California or Colorado, Texas would be a blue state. I do have to remark that that's a bit of unwelcome shade from a president whose failure 
to meet his own commitment to immigration reform and instead embarking on an unprecedented levels of deportation. Uh, and those acts by themselves probably led to significant suppression of Latino interest in the electoral process and in turning out to vote. Nonetheless, his comments point out the significance of the growth of the Latino community in likely political change in Texas. So what I remarked on in California and anticipated potentially happening in Arizona and Nevada also has ramifications in Texas where we might, may one day reach a state that a blue state of Texas has more progressive policies, but will we see the levels of underrepresentation that we see in California, particularly as in California since Latinos in Texas now the largest racial group. So two more quick things to say. First of all, I think that what we are, and this may be provocative, I recognize that when I talk about these things, there are folks who come to me later and say, oh, be, be careful, Tom, you're gonna be perceived as being anti-Black, anti-Asian American, when you talk about representation of Latinos in comparison to those other racial minority groups. I tell them that's certainly not at all what this is about. This is about recognizing the need for equity as well as diversity. An exclusive focus on diversity in my mind will always work to the detriment of the large and growing Latino community because too many in power define diversity as one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of these, instead of recognizing that if one of those groups is substantially larger, it should have more representation rather than simply having one, 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 one. But what we are seeing is in my mind more pernicious than even that notion. And it is a notion that I would characterize as the fungible minority theory. And that is the notion that we should accept that all minorities are the same and we should simply be striving for greater representation of people of color writ large without any attention to who is represented within those people of color that are being incorporated in leadership. The notion that we should be pleased if there is black or Asian American representation without regard to whether there is Latino representation because under this theory, all minorities are fungible. Any minority can represent the interests and concerns of any other minority group. It is a pernicious notion, but it is out there even if unspoken. That and the long legs of demographic fear and its manifestation in both exploitation and avoidance are what we are struggling with in my view in the Latino community, not just in the West, though anticipated and a precursor there, but really nationwide. And I will give one example. It also, as a lawyer, of course, I think first of the legal system, it also comes from the courts, where we have seen the Biden administration understandably lauded nationwide for increasing diversity in our federal court appointments. But in fact, the record for Latinos is decidedly worse than it is for other minority groups. Overall, Latinos have had appointments, nominations to the federal courts by the Biden administration that are at parity, roughly, with our population at about 20%. Every other, well, the other two major minority groups, three actually, in the country have had nominations that are multiples of their population parity. So Blacks have been appointed by the Biden administration to federal courts at two to three times population period. Asian Americans have been appointed to federal courts by the Biden administration at three to four times population period. Native Americans, largely because of their very small percentage of the national population, have been appointed by the Biden administration to the federal courts at four to five times population period. So we are the only racial minority group left with only parity. As I've said to the administration directly and to the public, it is wonderful then that the Biden administration has stopped digging the hole for Latinos, but without going above parity, it has done nothing to fill in the existing and significant hole of underrepresentation for Latinos on the federal judiciary. But most importantly, 
what we have seen from the Biden administration is appointments to the district courts, trial courts for Latinos, but a dearth of nominations to the more important courts of appeals, the second level of courts below the US Supreme Court. In these circuit court appointments across the country, the Biden administration at this point, really the end point of uh, its two years in office, the Biden administration has appointed 15 black judges to courts of appeals across the country. It has appointed 11 white judges to courts of appeals across the country. It has appointed six Asian Americans to courts of appeals across the country. It has appointed only five Latinos to courts of appeals across the country. I will note that only one of those five is a Latino woman. And that's my civil rights colleague, Merit Perez, to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York. So we are fourth, even though come January, we will mark 20 years. I emphasize this because Maldives will do its best, hopefully with your help, to mark this anniversary, accentuate it, and demand fair representation. But in January, it will be 20 years since the US Census Bureau reported that Latinos had surpassed Blacks to become the largest racial minority community in the United States. January 2023, the Census Bureau reported based on its projections from 20, 2002 that Latinos had surpassed Blacks. It certainly doesn't feel to me like we are being accorded what you would expect would be accorded in representation to a group that has for 20 years been the largest racial minority group in the country. And that I think is reflected in our being fourth in the number of appointments to Court of Appeals across the country, including only one Latino woman. It has consequences. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which includes the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, Texas obviously dominant, with its 40% Latino population, currently has not a single Latino or Latina judge actively sitting on the Fifth Circuit. The Tenth Circuit, which includes New Mexico with the largest Latino population proportion in the country, and Colorado and Utah, currently has no Latino or Latina judge actively sitting and hearing cases in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. And that is entirely a consequence of the Biden administration choosing to succeed the only Latino, Judge Carlos Lucero, on that court with a non-Latino nominee from the state of Colorado. So there are consequences for representation on our courts at the highest level from this underrepresentation that I've talked about and that I highlighted in the paper through the particular experience of California with a long history of anticipating being a precursor to civil rights developments through the Latino community for communities nationwide and laws nationwide. A long history of that being a trendsetter. And yet we have this disturbing current situation of the California paradox. So with that and an attempt to nationalize some of the issues I think we face, don't get me wrong, we still have significant policy issues and obviously policy can influence and affect representation in critically important ways. But I think uh, from my vantage point today that this issue of the California paradox is one we have to anticipate and come up with successful strategies to avert at a nationwide level. Thank you.